Okay. Welcome. Uh, this is to open the meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board of February 25th, 2019. Our first order of business is an, is an environmental design review, special permit public hearing for 10 Sunnyside Avenue, Arlington, Mass. To be presented by the group here, which is property owner Decon LP. Um, why don't and uh, Bob and EC is here to represent? Correct. And why don't you present to us? Thank you. <coughs> Come on up, Chris. We are being recorded by a Walter at ACMI. Okay. You should be aware that we have four members. One of our members could not make it back from a trip. And is Got it. Flight. Okay. And um, as we go through it, please be aware that. Understood. That and I will keep that in mind throughout. Okay. Uh, we are here on 10 Sunnyside Avenue, mm -hmm. and we believe this is a very exciting project for the town. Uh, uh, shortly, Chris Drew, seated to my right, who is the designer, is going to show you a slide presentation. He will show you what the conditions are on the site presently. Seated uh, to my left is Chris Cormier, the developer. He's not a major developer. He's done work in town before, uh, and he's never had complaints, as far as I know, with respect to the work that he's done. Uh, we don't have that many big sites left in town, and this is certainly not a big site. We don't have the Bud Johnson sites, we don't have the Bob Myrak sites left anymore. We do have a craving for home use. Uh, uh, people would like to move into town, they would like to rent, they would like to send their children to school here. And we believe that our presentation is a very good opportunity to let that happen. Now, we're proposing uh, a, to uh, by the way, the property is in a B4 zoning district, okay? And we're proposing 26 residential units and one retail space. Now, the lot size is 16,500 square feet, not 20,000 square feet. 16,500 square feet. I'm going to suggest to the members of the board that we comply in all respects with zoning. Why do I say that? I say that because we have met numerous times with the building department, the building inspector Michael Byrne, who is the zoning officer under Chapter 40A, who makes the determination as to how the zoning bylaw should be interpreted. Uh, and Mr. Byrne basically has seen our plans. If you look at the zoning information contained in the package which you have, and the zoning information is, is on one of the forms you have, you're going to see that we comply in all respects with the provisions of the zoning bylaw. Now, the FAR will be an issue that some of the uh, members in the audience may have something to say about, but I'm going to suggest to you that the building inspector has made a determination under Chapter 40A as the building inspector that despite the fact that we don't have 20,000 square feet because it's mixed use, that we can in fact take advantage of the bonus provisions in section 5.3.6 for the su uh, subsections 2, 3, and 4. And Chris Du will talk to you about that as he gets into his slide presentation. In addition, there may be some comment about a parapet, okay? Uh, well, I'm going to su uh, uh, suggest to you further that we have spoken with the building inspector about that. And if you look at section 5.3.20, that basically has an exemption for any kind of an addition that basically rises above the roof that is customary in arising above a roof. And I'm going to suggest to you that a parapet is something that is customary in arising above a roof. So we have a 50-foot uh, 
uh, height as far as the building is concerned uh, and four stories and again I'm going to suggest to you that we comply totally with the provisions of the zoning bylaw. We're here for environmental design review. We're here for you to look at the, uh, the project, tell us what you think, and if you have suggestions in terms of what the building ought to look like, I think that's why we're here. Uh, with respect to the type of units, the, uh, we have that broken down for you as well. We have seven one-bedroom units. We have 19 two-bedroom units for a total of 26. We also have four affordable housing units. And the uh, four affordable housing units are further broken down uh, with respect to uh, two two-bedrooms, uh, the uh, uh, two two bedrooms, uh, uh, another one bedroom, another one bedroom, uh, and we have a total of four. Okay. Now, with respect to parking, uh, we have a total of we need a total of 37 parking spaces, but we're only we only have 33 parking spaces. And the fact that we only have 33 parking spaces does not put us out of whack with zoning. Why? Because under the affordable housing provisions, we have the ability to get a bonus for four parking spaces. That brings us to the 33 parking spaces that we need. Uh, we have uh, parking spaces at, uh, at grade, uh, we have 13 parking spaces at, uh, at ground level, we have 20 parking spaces at uh, the basement garage level, and again for a total of 33. We're also going to show you, and Chris Drew is going to show you, that we have a fairly good size retail space on the first level. And that first, uh, that retail space does not require a parking space. Why? Because we're under 3,000 square feet. If we're under 3,000 square feet for the retail space, we do not require a parking space for that space. Now, with, uh, with respect to uh, what we're planning on doing with the building, uh, Chris again will talk with you about that uh, in terms of uh, how the interior of the building is going to set up. We have gone out of our way, Mr. Watson, to try to <laughs> keep you on our side with respect to bicycle parking. Uh, we have bicycle parking, not only a dedicated bicycle parking room on the first level as you enter the building, so as you enter the building, you're going to have a dedicated bicycle parking room. We have bicycle parking hooks <coughs> in the garage levels, okay, at each garage level space. We're also going to have a, piking rack, a, a bicycle uh, bike rack outside. Now, we're doing all of that because we re recognize the fact that we're close to the bike path, okay, and we're close to the brook as well. And this is a recreational area for a lot of people, and, and quite frankly, we are going to do our best to encourage people uh, certainly people who come to the retail space and certainly the tenants in the building uh, to, uh, in fact, use bicycles uh, as, as much as they can to cut down on the, uh, on the, uh, the vehicle, uh, the hip of the traffic. Now, if you've been down there at all, or you've looked at the, the, the pictures, okay, uh, and Chris will show you some of those momentarily, you can see that this is a fairly good sized commercial area. Now this is kind of out of character with the balance of Sunnyside Ave. By the way, Sunnyside Ave doesn't conjure up in my mind an image of a commercial area, okay? But to some extent it is a commercial area because you have commercial uh, buildings in that area. One of the commercial owners has called me and indicated to me that he's in favor, uh, and that would be Harry Allen, okay? He called me more than a month ago and indicated that uh, he would have no objection to uh, our plans being approved, so that's one of the semi-abutters down in the neighborhood. Uh, so again, with respect to what we're proposing, we think it's good for the town, we think, uh, we think it opens up, and, and, and I know 
as a matter of fact, being a proper owner myself in this town, I own a few units, okay, that the folks are clamoring for space in the town. They want the school system, they want to be in the town. This is going to open up 26 units, okay, uh, four of those units being affordable, okay, so that uh, folks like that who want to be in the town and perhaps send their kids to school in the town can do so. With that, Chris, I'm going to ask you to make your slide presentation. Thank you. So the proposal itself is to erect a new four-story mixed-use building with 26 uh, residential units, a mixture of one and two bedroom units. This will include one retail space at grade along Sunnyside Ave, an at-grade garage, I'm sorry, an at-grade and basement garage with a total of three, 33 parking spaces will be, will be provided on site with bike hooks at each parking space. A dedicated bike storage room will be located right off the main entrance of the residential. But the overall design of the building has taken many helpful cues from the Arlington design standards, such as breaking up the massing, uh, anchoring the building um, at the front, uh, additional bays, stepping the building back in places, making the residential entry very prominent by anchoring a heavy feature um, on the building. The project itself does not directly abut the L, um, L Wave Greenway Park bike path, but it's in close proximity to the bike path. We felt it was important to incorporate that into an exterior design, so we added the um, bike racks in front of the retail space so that anyone visiting or going to the retail spaces would be encouraged to use the bikes and not need a vehicle uh, to get to and from the site itself. The project uh, will create home ownership, including four affordable units, two group two units, um, with the remaining being group one adaptable. The project itself has been designed as of right and will not need any zoning variances. Again, the zoning district is uh, section 5.5E4. The lot size is 16,500. The, the proposed gross square footage is 30,525 for an FAR of 1.85, and the proposed building height is 50 feet. It's just an uh, aerial of the existing site here, it's shaded in red. Here is the bike path, here is Sunnyside, and here is Broadway. Which side is the retail facing? So the retail itself will be uh, right over here facing this way to Sunnyside. Fronting on Sunnyside, uh, Andy. <clears throat> it's just a uh, existing picture of the existing building that's there now, the existing one-story garage. And just looking a little further down, and again, Broadway is basically right here. And looking back, there's the existing garage with the, with the um, <coughs> parking area. Um, you know, one thing to note on this is there is there is really no landscaping on the current site itself. Again, just looking back, again, here's Broadway, here's the building in the site. So there's a, the zoning information itself, again, it's a, it's a um, section 5.5 B4 district, current existing use is an automotive garage, 26 units, one retail space, lot size is 16,500. Um, in this area, the minimum, minimum lot size is none. We have 16.5. The minimum lot frontage is 50 feet. We have 150 feet. The maximum FAR is 1.5. With the additional provisions, um, because of the mixed use, we have up to an additional 25% bonus provision, which gets us to an FAR of 1.875. Um, again, this has had many, many conversations with the building department um, on their view on it, and this is how they have... This is how they've addressed it and how they have said that this is the, the FAR for the area. We're act, we actually come in slightly under at um, 1.85 for a total of 30,525 square feet. Again, maximum stories is four stories. We're at four stories. Maximum building height is 50 feet, and again, that's to the roof. Um, the parapet, which I'll kind of go over in elevation, but there is a four-foot parapet. The idea behind that is to screen any mechanicals up there. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to seeing something set back, it makes it, it, makes it much safer for anybody um, servicing the, the equipment um, by having that parapet wall. The minimum front yard is zero. We're at three foot six at the closest and five foot six. The minimum side yard is zero. We're at, we're at 15 feet, 19 feet, 21 feet, and 25 feet. And again, I'll point that out as we get into the plan itself. The minimum rear yard is 16 feet. We are at 21 feet at the closest on the upper floor and 25 feet at the bottom. The minimum required landscape area is 10%, which is 3,052. We are actually higher than that with the landscape. We're almost, we're double that at 7,062 square feet. 
the minimum usable open space is 20%, which is 6105, and we're at 6125. Um, so again, we're just really slightly above on that number. Again, the parking requirement. Um, so for a one bedroom, the one bedroom unit that we've got seven, it's 1.5 per, comes out to 8.05 spaces. The two bedroom at 19 units comes out is 1.5, which comes out to 28.5. Again, the retail space we have one, um, which would normally be one, would which be uh, one per 300 square feet. But there is the provision provision in the code that for the first 3,000 square feet of a non-residential space mixed use uh, that it is exempt. So we're only at 21, 24, which requires zero parking spaces. The total parking spaces would be 37. Minus the 10% reduction for the affordable housing, we have four units, gets us to a total to, um, total required parking space of 33 spaces. Again, we have 13 at the ground level parking garage and uh, 20 in the basement for a total of 33 parking spaces. Unit breakdowns, we have seven one bedrooms, which are a mixture of 482 to about 854 square feet and 19 two bedroom units at about 801 square feet to about 1,173 square feet for a total of 26 residential units, one retail space at uh, 2,124 square feet. Again, this is just our affordable units that we're, so we're doing uh, unit number two, unit number nine, which are both two bedroom units. They're located on the second floor. And we have a um, two one bedrooms, which is unit uh, 17 and unit 26, um, which 17 is located on the third floor, 26 is on the fourth floor. Um, at, 20, at 26 units, 5% need to be um, group two, which is 1.3, we round it up to two. So our two proposed group two units will be unit two and unit 17. Um, a two bedroom and a one bedroom, and again, those are affordable units as well. This is just our lead checklist. We did come in at 40, which is certified. This is a um, picture of a rendering and a picture of a building that we're currently actually doing in Brighton, um, which will have a lot of the same materials, um, kind of similar type design, um, just to kind of give you an idea of, of the quality of work that um, Chris does um, in building, in detail. Um, you know, we've been using a mixture of like five and seven inch reveal, hiding plane siding, um, and the got brick, uh, black frame, aluminum storefront doors and windows, um, black frame Anderson uh, sliding doors and windows up, up on the upper floor and um, um, aluminum railings on the um, upper floors. Uh, the existing plot plan, so again here is the outline of the existing building here. Here is the parking lot on this side with all the cars. Sunny side out here and um, Broadway is right here. The proposed plot plan, so again Broadway, I'm sorry, Broadway is right here. We've got sunny side. Our, ve our vehicular entrance here for the garage, for the basement, our vehicular entrance here for the um, garage on the, on the uh, first floor. Again, first floor plan, so we've got our sidewalk here with sunny side running right here. So you come in right here into the residential entry where we've got one, a one bedroom unit on the ground floor. We've got a um, large mail package room here um, for deliveries, mail, all that kind of stuff. We've got a nice large bike room here for uh, um, additional storage. We've got our primary staircase here with a primary elevator. A little further down here, we've got our entrance into our retail space, which does have two bike um, racks right out front of the retail. We have our entrance in here into the garage going down to the basement, and our drive around here into the garage for these parking spaces. So we have a total of 13 parking spaces here. Um, we have a little patio back here um, for the residents of the building. And then, um, so this is where we've got the 25 feet here. We've got 25 feet here. We've got uh, 21 feet here. On the upper floor, you will notice that we do punch out a little bit here and over here. So the building comes over that parking. Mm -hmm. Yes. The gray. Correct. So just to, to this point here, and then we have we have a four foot overhang here. But this is just a patio area right here. So that's a black wall with parking behind it. Correct. But it's above grade. Yes. This is just some. Um, I'll go back to that for a second. Sure. <clears throat> and then it's at grade at the bottom. It's at grade all around. There's no slope. Correct. It's a flat site. Yes. There is an existing retaining wall back here currently, uh, which will remain. And that faces. 
That's so, sunny side is sunny side is along the bottom of the sheet. Okay. So you got sunny side, and then Broadway is running right right here on the left side. But there's no building right before Broadway. Right there is a there is a brick building right here in the corner. I'll go back on the um, the aerial. So yeah, actually you can kind of see it right there too, the, the brick brick building that faces uh, Broadway. So it's this that building right there. Okay. Go back. Yeah, okay. There's a parking lot behind the building. That's a parking lot. That's part of your site. Yeah, so okay, here's the existing site, you know, the existing garage okay, right, okay, right. and then the parking there. Sorry, okay. No problem. safety features um, that will be included as part of the building. Um, so we will have a nice big mirror um, for the cars coming up um, to see pedestrians that may be crossing the street, um, as well as an um, alert system at the top um, that will alert both cars and people um, so there's no, no cross there. This is just some images of some stuff that we're thinking of. Um, so like the out, outside of the um, residential entry, we, we're going to have two, we're thinking of having two benches. Um, so this is the kind of bench that we're thinking of. For the, re for the retail bike parking, we're thinking something like this on the, at the entry. Um, in the bike storage room, we're thinking of having a, this kind of a rack system so we can maximize the additional amount of bikes. And then these are the, this is the type of lockable bike um, hook that will be at each parking space. So again, that'll be an additional 33 bikes, bike um, storage hooks plus the um, bike storage room itself. So as you come down, so again, here's Sunnyside Ave right here, Broadway's over here. We, come, we drive down the garage here, we've got a total of 20 parking spaces. Um, we've got the two stairwells, the main elevator, um, and then we've got some mechanical space, um, an additional trash room, all down in the basement. The second floor itself um, consists of uh, two one-bedroom units and uh, seven two, I'm sorry, two one-bedroom units, seven two-bedroom units. Um, so again, Sunnyside Ave is running along the bottom, Broadway is along the left. Um, so what we've done is we've got our main stairway here, elevator, and our secondary stair. Um, this is one of the affordable and group two units here, um, which is unit number, um, unit number, I'm sorry. I believe it's the unit number uh, two. Um, and then we've got our additional affordable unit here, which is a two-bedroom. So we've got a two-bedroom unit there and a two-bedroom unit there. Mm -hmm. On the third floor, this is where we step the building back. Um, so this is all the floor below. Again, sunny side running along the bottom here. We've got an, another group two and affordable unit here, which is just a one-bedroom unit. Um, so we've got two uh, one-bedroom units and six two-bedroom units for a total of eight units for the floor. Um, one affordable and uh, one group two unit. The fifth, the fourth floor, I'm sorry. Again, same alignment as the third floor. Um, we've got our, our final affordable unit there, which is a one bedroom unit. Um, and it's two one bedroom units and seven two bedroom units for a total of nine units. The roof plan itself. Um, so again, this is kind of the, the area where we're planning on having any mechanicals or anything like that that need to go on the roof. Um, which will be far back from the edges of it. The front elevation here, again, along um, Sunnyside Ave. So this will be the, the residential entry here and the retail entry here. The, the garage going to the basement here. And again, the drive to the um, back of the, the first floor garage will be right down this way here. Um, so again, as you can see, that kind of over, overhangs there. We've got some balconies on the side. Uh, excuse me. So this is where we were talking about with the parapet. So here's the top of the roof here at 50 feet, and then we do have um, a four-foot parapet high wall. And again, that is for additional screening and buffering for any mechanicals or anything like that up there. 
So what's the total height with the mechanicals? Oh, actually, you, you oh, have to hold your comment until the board goes, and then we're going to open it up. Okay. Um, so again, the the materials of the materials will be an aluminum storefront window will be aluminum storefront doors and windows, um, black brick um, in the in the bricked areas, um, five and seven inch reveal Heidi plank siding, and Anderson um, one hundred windows. Hold on, because he he asked a question that I had too. So go back to that. Sure. So point point and go slow for a second. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. T tell us again. What are the materials on this? So these will be. Um, aluminum storefront doors right. and windows. Uh, these will be Anderson windows. With Again, what? Just silver frames or? Uh, black. Black frames? Black frames. It's not rendered that way. So that's silver there. Or white. Yes. It, it, the problem was we had originally done it black, but because of the brick, it just, it all looked the same. So. And then, and then what's the material there? So this will be a mixture of five and five and seven inch reveal hardy plank siding. Where's the brick? I didn't see the brick. So the brick here. What? Brick here. Oh, I see. Brick, brick here, the and then darker. yeah. So then this is Hardy Plank, Hardy Plank, and then this is all Hardy Plank up here. Again, a mixture of five and seven um, inch reveal. And what color is the brick? It will probably be of, of a gray, a lighter gray, um, similar um, to the. Um, let me go back here. Sorry. It will probably some, be something similar um, to these colors here. So the uh, the right side elevation. So again, this is the this is the drive down. Sunny side is right here. This is the garage door into that um, back parking area. Um, secondary egress here. Again, many much of the same materials. Uh, this will pretty much all be five and seven inch hardy plank reveal siding. Um, we will have a little bit of brick in the front here, but the rest of this we're going to soften it up with, with just some hardy plank and and soften it um, on the sides. The rear elevation, um, so again, we've got those three bays here with balconies in between, um, which will help with screening from neighbor to neighbor and that type of thing. Um, we've got our parking garage at this level here, and then there is a you know the parking garage down here. Um, again, similar type materials. We'll have um, five and seven inch hardy plank reveal siding and, and hardy plank siding in these bays, as well, and sorry, in these uh, inlets as well. So the bricks only on the front. Correct. And what's the what's the molding at the top? The it will be a PVC um, material. And the uh, left side elevation. So again, this is actually that re this is that residential unit here. Um, so they will have a little patio to walk out to directly from their unit. Um, so they'll be able to you know enjoy the outside as well. Um, and then we've got our our balconies above on the upper units. We do carry the brick around on this side to, to right here, and then the rest of it basically all transitions to um, five and seven inch hardy plank reveal siding. At, that, at this point, um, unless Bob has something else to add, we will open it up for questions. I don't believe I do. I think that uh, if you have questions, we'd love to entertain them. Okay. Um, I'd like to let the board comment. Uh, Dave, do you want to go first, or do you want to go around the other way? Ask. Uh, <laughs> you want me to go or first? Or first. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll go. No, I, well, I, uh, I appreciate you uh, jumping right in and uh, bringing up some of the issues that, uh, that you know uh, are going to raise questions and so I, I would just like to ask Jenny um, on the zoning issues whether you um, uh, had any involvement with those discussions or have anything to, to add. I didn't have any direct involvement in the discussions that Bob was talking about. Bob spoke directly with the building inspector about I reaffirmed that with Mr. Byrne today by the way. On the zoning issue. So to follow up on that, so your understanding is that um, the parking requirement, for instance, a reduction of 10% based on the affordable is, a, is it within our zoning code? Yeah, and that's that's contained in my memo. The other which, which part of that memo? Uh, the, that's in uh, on page five. <coughs> Thanks. I was looking for it. Yeah, about the parking. 
I was I was more You're interested in the uh, in, in the FAR and uh, the prior each one. I reaffirm that with Michael Byrne at 1 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, not only that, but we started with Michael Byrne on this about four months ago. And we wouldn't have done anything without having an assurance from the building inspector that, in fact, we were going to be okay on the FAR, that we were not bound by the 20,000 square foot situation. With that in mind, we went ahead and designed what we did. I saw Mr. Loretti's memo in with the package that went to the board. I called Mr. Byrne again at 1 o'clock today. I said, are you firm with respect to what you've told me? He said, yes. I asked him also about the parapet issue when I called at 1 o'clock today. And he said to me, you're right on in terms of your interpretation of that section of the bylaw. So I guess my... My question is, as far as uh, this board goes, is um, where does that leave us uh, with respect to uh, uh, to making a decision based on the information before us where uh, we're being presented with a judgment call that has, has been presumed to have been made by the building inspector? I think if, you know, that... That is, if you are, this is your jurisdiction and you have the jurisdiction to make a decision about a proposal, that's before you, number one. Number two, you can ask the applicant for more information or further follow-up if needed. Um, and so you, that is the information that is being provided. So if you have a more specific follow-up for the applicant, then that's what you may request. I have no problem with the board communicating directly with the building inspector to confirm what I'm indicating to the board right now. I appreciate that. I and mean, he is the enforcement officer under Chapter 40A, and he made that determination, and based upon that, we've done what we've done. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I, I understand. Um, I mean, I, I feel like we ought to have a little more follow-up on that. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I don't know whether that would be a direct communication with the building inspector. I'm, I'm not sure what the appropriate, the most appropriate way of dealing with that is, but since, I mean, it, it, it is something that, that, um, that on its face is a little bit ambiguous. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah, I think I would feel more comfortable than the clarity. Sorry, I'm not laughing at what you're saying. It's Gene leaving. Can I speak Gene? I think the building inspector is wrong. I do not think it's an arguable case at all. And I would want the building inspector to come to one of our meetings and have a discussion with all of us about it. So we all have an understanding and either I come around to his point of view, he comes around to my point of view, or I'll vote that this can't go ahead if I can't come around to his point of view. So I would not go ahead with just one of us calling him, I would want him at our meeting to have this discussion about the parapet and the floor area issue, because I think he's wrong. So I would double follow up and agree with you that he should also have a letter first, and then he should come here and talk directly to us. It's too important an issue that's going to be rippling along as we go along. So I would agree with you that should ask that a letter, I don't want to jump in, but we'll make this one point, point number one, that we'd like to see a letter from him, and then we'd like to see him come in and address directly to us if any questions come and up. And you will communicate with him? Yeah, I will, yeah, yeah. I will communicate right. with him okay. based upon this. <clears throat> but, well, there might be more. So, so it's fine. That's point number one, back in tracking to you. Back tracking to you. Okay. Uh, uh, per perhaps uh, on moving on to uh, some less fundamental issues. Um, but since we're here, I think it's uh, as good a time as any to talk about it. Um, you uh, gave us in our packets tonight some, um, some additional graphics and information about materials that we hadn't seen previously. Um, and uh, I appreciate the additional information 
it did, did raise some questions in my mind, um, um, not surprisingly, about uh, bike parking. Um, so uh, first off, I, I do very much appreciate uh, your, your efforts um, to provide uh, a significant amount uh, of bike parking. Um, this, this site is at a location that uh, uh, is, is very well situated. Uh, for people to to bike or walk to to various locations, uh, including um, uh, the Minuteman or the uh, Wife Greenway or into Somerville or, or other places. So uh, that's that's a good thing. Um, one easy thing is uh, the racks that you're proposing for the outside bike racks are terrible racks. Um, so they're they're very commonly used and they're very attractive, but they're functionally very very bad racks. So um, assuming that that we're able to work through the the uh, more fundamental issues, um, uh, I think the planning department uh, can can help you um, if we're identify some that, we just, some, you know. some more functional racks. Um, I I do um, I'm I'm actually very intrigued uh, with your ideas about the inside bike parking. I'm, I'm not sure that the space you set around, set aside for a bike room is is actually big enough. Do you know what the dimensions of that room on the first floor are? Yes. Um, so one thing to note, and I just want to jump ahead for two seconds, sure. is that uh, the first floor itself, it is uh, 15 feet from the from the first floor to the second floor. So it does have a ceiling height of about 13 feet. Mm -hmm. um, so it is nice and high. Yeah. Um, one which benefits the retail space, but also um, helps with stacking. You know, getting, making this kind of a um, a bike system work, where we can kind of, you know, yeah. and you still have headroom and stuff like that. that you're not, you know, yeah. knocking yourself out. Yeah. The bike room itself, uh, it is. It's about. Uh, it's uh, six by about 11, 10 and a half feet. Yeah. So. Um, if that were the only bike parking in this building, I would definitively say it's mm -hmm. it's not big enough because there's potentially, with a building this size and in this location, there's potentially going to be dozens of bikes. Mm -hmm. um, e e even if even if every parking space is filled with cars, there's probably still going to be dozens of bikes in this building. Uh, and I, I I gotta say I'm intrigued by your idea of using these ceiling mounted bike storage um, um, mechanisms. Uh, I have to say, um, I, I've never seen them used in kind of a commercial context mm -hmm. like this. I've seen them used in people's garages yep. for their own personal bikes and one or two of them. I'm, I'm not sure uh, how robust they are for um, ongoing day-to-day -day use by lots of people. Um, so that's something to consider whether that's actually an appropriate solution for okay. kind of a, a high volume environment like mm -hmm. this. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, I, I like the idea of giving everybody sort of their own their own private bike rack in at the back of the parking spaces, but I'm not sure how comfortable people would be um, hanging their bikes on a rack in in a garage where they're accessible to, to other people, even if they can lock them there. Mm -hmm. Although it, do, it does look like the garage is not accessible to the public. Correct. Um, so that 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 could also be workable. Um, so I, I think you've got some, some good ideas here. I think I, in a, ideally, if you had the space, it would be nice to have a, a, a larger room where you could just have roll-in, roll-out access for the all of the dozens of bikes that people might have. But, you know, I, I think if these are the constraints that you have to work with, you know, I, I think with the combinations of the different things you're thinking about, you can probably make it work but I would also say that under the circumstances um, uh, I would also say that uh, people must be allowed to also bring their bikes up into their units which is feasible mm -hmm. since you do have an elevator in the building. Mm -hmm. sure. okay. 
it works. Um, I may have other questions, but I'll pass them along for the moment. Ken? Um, well, let me start with, I'm going to skip over, I'm not trying to diminish the zoning thing, but we'll, that they already said enough, I'm not going to mention any more about that, okay? Okay. Uh, but I do want to ask about uh, your group two. Yes. Um, uh, handicapped units, okay? Mm -hmm. And your percentage of affordable units. Mm -hmm. So you have four affordable units. Correct. And two group two units. Yes. Okay. It's 5% of the 26. Yes, I realize that. But your group two units happen to be all in the affordable units. Mm -hmm. I'm asking you to see if you consider taking one of those group two units and putting it in a non-affordable unit. Oh, I'm, sure, I'm sure that's possible. Okay, because right now you're assuming that everybody that needs an affordable unit mm -hmm. is going to be handicapped. Mm -hmm. And let's say you put someone that's not that can afford a unit, and maybe they may require some of the handicapped mm -hmm. system to be good, okay? So you have no problem doing that? No, I'm, no. Chris? No. Um, I was not sure about your bathrooms in your uh, Group 2 units. Mm -hmm. uh, are they just not shown as a Group 2 bathroom right now, or...? They're they shown just schematically at the moment, but we so have the room so that they will be all... So in the future, those in the Group 2 bathrooms, they will be truly Group 2 bathrooms, so they'll be larger? Correct. Yes. Okay. Um, and again, the reason we hadn't gone too far into that was because because of this, you know, we, we figured we would propose it this way. But, you know, if you guys said, you know what, we want all the group two, all, you know, market rate or whatever, you know, or we want one and one or whatever it is. So that way it kind of gave everybody a little bit of, you know. Okay. But you can show it's... Absolutely. Okay. And then, uh, that takes care of that. You, know, you said the roof right now is surrounded by a parapet, right? A four foot parapet. Correct. So is the roof internally drained? Yes, there will be. So it'll be, it'll be a dual mm -hmm. uh, roof drains there. Correct. So there'll be no scuppers, no um, rain leaders, anything we put no. right outside the building? No. Okay. Um, the garage, mm -hmm. above and below? Yeah. Are those garages enclosed? Yes. Okay, so how do you plan to mechanically ventilate those uh, spaces? We'll probably have to have um, some louvers and stuff. I'd like you to show it on the plans and, okay. and uh, on the elevations. Okay. Um, just because the intake is not a problem. Mm -hmm. It's always the exhaust that's the issue. Right. Because you have windows mm -hmm. around all the perimeter going above it. Mm -hmm. So are you planning to run the exhaust up through the building? Or are you going to run it through the side? I don't know, but yeah. I'd like you to address that because okay. it's going it's to affect how this thing's laid out. Mm -hmm. uh, on your landscaping plans, mm -hmm. or I'm going to say lack of, can you show us a landscaping plan uh, besides just green dots? I want you to call up bushes. Sure. I want you to call up trees, calibers, all that kind of stuff so we know what we're getting, not just because I, I can't tell what I'm getting there. Okay. You have a patio on the back there, right? Mm -hmm. How do you get to it? Right up, the, you can go right out the front and walk around. How? I mean, there's no walkway? I mean, you just walk across the grass or is yes. there? So you would leave the front of the building and walk around and, and walk on that side of it? Because mm -hmm. the other side shows all the bushes so you walk down the driveway. Right, there'll be, there'll be bushes here and, and that's, what, that's what you're kind of seeing in those elevations. Um, I mean, we can add, you know, we can add a door off the garage, um, you know, but you, you can come right out here and right into the back. All right, maybe if you just add maybe um, a loose, small uh, walkway, is okay. that, that going to affect your open space? No. So maybe at the end of the, end of the driveway, show some sort of walkway to connect the two. <laughs> just, a, just a way of indicating how people are going to use it. Because if you don't show anything like that, no one's going to use it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's a nice space back there. Okay. At the bottom of the ramp, mm -hmm. I like the fact that you showed the indicator of a car coming out of the uh, coming out of the driveway. Mm -hmm. I think you should add since, since it's a one-way driveway. Okay, you got to add another alarm at the bottom of the driveway. Mm -hmm. So if a car is coming down, mm -hmm. 
and someone's in the garage trying to leave, yep. he has to stop and pause until the guy's coming down the driveway goes all the way down. Okay. This way, always you won't get into this, this argument about some guy backing up all the way up the driveway, right. which caused the danger to the area there. Okay? Are there any issues with the turning radius getting into that ramp on the right side? I don't think so. It's all within dimensional requirements, so I'm not as concerned about that right now. We'll leave it at that for now, okay? Okay, thank you. I'm all done. Thank you. Gene? Can you say again how wide the driveway is? So the the entrance into here is 12 feet, and then it's another 12 feet here. So the entrance into... The garage going down, the garage going to the basement, and then this is, I'm sorry, about 14 feet here. So anybody who's accessing who has to drive into the back or out of the back would be on the 14-foot drive. Right? Correct. I mean, yeah, right through here. So why, why isn't this required to be a 24-foot driveway, which is what the zoning code calls for, when it's a one-way driveway? That was addressed. Um, and do you remember what Mike's, because we had looked at that. Yeah, Mike, uh, again, determined that we did not need that 24-foot wide. And what was his rationale? Pardon me? What was his rationale for that? Uh, I'll have to check my notes on so, that. So okay. when we talked to Mike, yeah, that did yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you call up the lead check check sheet and walk us through it, please? It's a little small. Yeah. There was supposed to be a narrative description. And there's not really an added description in the application of what you're going to do for lead. It just says you're going to do lead, and then there's the checklist. So I think we need a narrative description of um, what you're going to do. So I'm, I'm trying to understand the checklist, but I was looking at a very small copy on my computer. Are, are you saying that you think the, the left-hand green column are the points that you're going to have? Yeah. Yes. And the, Right-hand column, you're not going to get. I don't think so. So the maximum points that you can have is 40. Yes. Well, that's the points that we're going to shoot for is 40. Yeah. Okay. So 40 is only certification. Mm -hmm. It's not even silver level. I think you need to do better. You know, if you miss one point, you're not even going to be certified under lead. And there's a real preference that these projects have lead certification. Not a requirement, but a real preference. Yeah. So I think just using 40 is not enough, and you should aim for at least silver. So I'd like you to think about how you might get there on that. Um, Gene, uh, in the application, actually, they do outline how they meet lead. It's under number 12. Yeah, but it was, it was yeah, no, not that, really no, but that, that, that is the narrative that was provided. Right. I just it's want to not, make that clear. I know, clear. it's not and really then, a good narrative. Okay, but there was narrative yes. provided. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Um, do you know if the site's ever been flooded, let's say, in the 21st century? Do we know what? Did, has this site ever flooded in the 21st century? Has Elwife Brook ever <laughs> overtopped and flooded this site? Yeah. No, you'll get your chance. I'd love to hear your answers, but do any of you know whether the site's been flooded in the 21st century? Okay. Um, that's it. Yeah. So, um, just kind of following up a little bit. We've got, I counted, um, eight points. Um, I'm going to add a ninth, which is general comment. Um, it's hard to understand the drawings when you don't have a site plan. It's right here. Okay, you need a colored site plan like the one on the next sheet that shows where the landscape is and you've got to show the buildings around it. Okay. A site plan has the context around it, so you show the buildings all around it. You understand where you are, what's on either side of you, parking lot, building. I had trouble figuring out where I was. 
So when you, sh you should have this one, you could you could use your ground floor plan and shrink it down so that you could see your ground floor in context, mm -hmm. just so there's a way to okay. talk about the building, where you're going, how, where when you come out, where are you. Sure. Um, you need a site plan. You show elevations. You show flat-on facades, but there's no three-dimensional drawing at all. I think, and I, I can refer to Jenny about it, you need some three-dimension. We You don't have to build a model of mm -hmm. small projects, but a three-dimensional drawing okay. so that you see it from the corner and you understand how the whole thing goes together. I can't quite tell. Okay. Um, two views would be the kind of thing that you normally see. Mm -hmm. It would be a sketch-up view or whatever. Yeah. Um, you got to show your materials on your new building and note them and bring some kind of a photograph or an example of each material. <coughs> if, it's, if it's the building you showed us, the other buildings, which are different height building, and you kind of just said it's kind of like this, that's not good enough for us. Okay. Um, and we're probably getting more sensitive about it as things begin to come about as time is, as, as Mass Avenue is, is going to be developing right. a whole other subject. So you're in the wheelhouse. That's the way it goes. Not a problem. Um, I'm not in love with the PVC molding at the top, just because I've started to see how it looks. Mm -hmm. It's very shiny and looks really fake, And then, but prove to me I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. I'd be happy to, for you to tell me that this is a really good product okay. for the molding. Um, and just a better explanation of the materials. Like you could do it, by, again, by saying, here's the brick and here's what it looks like on another building mm -hmm. and here's the type. So you. Help us through the whole thing. I really can't tell. Okay. Um, so those, and I think you need a section through the building as well. So you cut through the building and you show what's below grade, what's yeah. below grade, kind of basic stuff like that. So I'd say that's that's my point nine. And the points that I have, Jenny, I can, I'll just quickly yeah. summarize. I've got the big one, the zoning. Yeah. We okay. want a letter and we want him in person to come talk to us. This is too important. Gene brought up. Number two, bikes. The yep. issues that were brought up around bikes. Bike parking in general. Indoor yep. and outdoor. There was more description of that. Number three, uh, group group two units. <coughs> the issue of make, making sure that the Separate. group two unit is not always the affordable yep. unit. And then there was one other aspect to that. that Accessible. Yeah. Garage vent, that's a good one. That's a code issue too. You got to be careful. If it's not. And within, showing it on a plan. Within ten feet of, a, of an operable window. Correct. The landscape plan. Ken talked about that. That goes. That's when I. That goes along with my site plan comment. If you could show a real, Absolutely. full site plan and show where that building is and a little bit around it. <coughs> on the ramps. So six and seven are both about the driveway. Six was light. The green light, red light, I wrote down, and seven was the driveway, which was an issue about how wide it needed to be. So we, you need to come back to us, and this may be part of what Mike is going to. I think that's for Mike. Yeah, the driveway yeah. width. Yeah. Because if, with Mike. I've seen valet ramps where there's a red light and you can't go, and then you. Yeah, Andy, I think uh, the answer is it's coming back to me at this point. The answer is that Mike indicated that the uh, method of access and egress, okay and the method of parking had to do with what the width of the road had to be, the driveway had to be. Okay. That's the way he analyzed it, okay. but I'd rather that you get it directly from him. Okay? Okay. So that should be one of the Agreed. questions. That yeah. he, Is it a driveway? Yeah. Like a, but he was okay with it, and he okay. based it on the analysis I'm okay. talking well, that's about. That's good. Okay. And then the last, uh, then eight was the narrative for Lee to... Mm -hmm. um, and trying to get some more lead points. I don't believe, we want you to, obviously, we want you to strive for silver, but I don't think he's required to go beyond certified, but no. it's a very good point, because the whole town is going that way, the whole world is going that way, and we'd like to see that effort get into it. And then nine was my point again about the materials, mm -hmm. some 3D, a section, and a real site plan that shows yes. content. Yeah, absolutely. And do we, do we also need to see uh, more of the drainage plan uh, for how yeah. we're going to deal with water? Right. Right. Let's, let's make that 10. That, that can be what we've done in the past is 
getting more information for them to consult with the town engineer about that. Storm water. First storm yeah. water, and then getting something in writing to us. Yeah. But there could be something more than that. But that, that is something. We can do that. Sure. I mean, because the site, you know, is close enough to the brook, I'd like them to go to the town engineer and ask get something back from the town engineer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. About Okay, that drainage in town at all. Is <coughs> yeah. So, I'm going to recommend that we continue. Mm -hmm. and, but I think we uh, we're, we have enough homework to do that I would yeah. certainly not object to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're required to have public comment. Mm -hmm. um, I just you heard how it goes, everybody, and this is going to be continued. So I would. The hearing will be continued. I urge you not to be too long about any comments. As you can see where we're going to go, we're going to come back to a lot of very substantial comments that they want to address. So we're going to open up public comment, but please keep it brief. State your name and address, and we will hear your comment. Yes. Hi, Miguel Munoz, 44 Michael Street. We're less than 300 feet. So I have a quest two questions on sound and light. And then I want to make uh, the current pollution from the site. So on sound, if in the next hearing we could hear how they plan to mitigate the sound from the HVAC and the roof, which will have a direct line to our house, and also if there's a pump for the exhaust and any other site, and also during the construction, um, what are going to be the impacts during construction? What is the plan? Um, I want to point out that the, cur the site currently has how do you call this? It has a tarp on the roof. And this tarp is blown to shreds. Mm -hmm. It's been there for a while. Our yard is full of these things coming from the tarp from the side. So is the creek. So is the creek, and so is all in the neighboring area. So I'll, I'll just leave this with the board so you can. <laughs> <laughs> so I would urge the owner to clean up the property before asking for approval. In compliance with our good and the conservation okay. agent. Yeah. And this has been reported to the town already, but it's just one to one sample. The mechanical equipment and also uh, during construction. Yeah, that's the mitigation of sound. Oh, and, and but the other one was light. Light. Oh yeah, light. So if the if there's gonna be all these balconies that are facing towards our properties from a height, mm -hmm. are we gonna have straight lights pointing to our windows or what? No, you're not gonna have that. No. But you should address that in your lighting plan so that they know mm -hmm. that it's um, you know protected. Cool. Shield. And uh, sorry, uh, I did forget something. Uh, you did bring up a good point. Can you, when you show the roof plan, mm -hmm. uh, when you come back, can you guys add the mechanical equipment on there? Put the mechanicals. Mm -hmm. Yes, but right now you can show a pen uh, where it would go. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you have split systems there with cooling towers. I'll be honest, that hasn't been, because it was so early, it hasn't even been decided yet as far as, you know, what type of system and all that. So typically at this stage we don't show that because we don't get a mechanical engineer involved because... We don't quite know what direction we're going yet. Uh, okay, I've never done it that way before. I've been. I think we need to make a determination about that. Okay, because you already show mechanical yeah. clots in the units yeah. already. We need to make that determination okay. before we come back. Because okay. um, right. right now I do not believe you're going to fit. Yeah. Twenty-eight or whatever. Right. Uh, we will. Uh, units in that pen of yours. Yeah. And then show show the uh, override for the elevator too. Yeah. Sorry. Sir. Sir. Uh, I'd like to address a serious safety issue in Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Can we have the um, view of the first floor again? Sure. Okay, it um, relates to this ramp going to the lower garage. Uh, generally, the guidelines for ramps and parking garages is 15% slope or less, and even then they encourage that there are transition zones at each end. Um, and in fact, that's consistent with Arlington standards for residential driveways. And of course, where just two years ago, you unanimously voted to limit driveways to 15% slope. Um, <coughs> the petitioner hasn't presented any elevation views to show what actually is going on down in the garage. So I've taken the liberty of preparing it for you. In fact, 
that slope down to the garage is 21% slope. May I see one of those? I don't have any others. Here. I assume Thank your you. architect would have provided you with drawings that showed you what the ramp slope is. Um, and this is just extremely dangerous. It, this comes out, unlike a residential driveway where you have 20 feet or so going up to the sidewalk, this comes right out of the door, right onto the sidewalk with people are going by and coming out at 21 percent. It's just clearly unsafe. And as we look what's happening at the bottom of it, um, there's really no decent field of view. When I've been in parking garages with ramps, generally the sides are open so you can see what's around the corner. These are just solid walls and a blind corner that you have to go around. The reason we have marriage. Yeah. yeah. No, that's a very good point. Yeah. Yeah. That's 21%. That's it's just a way above the 15% that Arlington recognizes as a safe slope. Okay. Uh, and just one quick comment on these four foot parapets. Um, if these are customary additions, um, I would expect them to show plenty of examples in Arlington where you have apartment buildings with four foot parapets above the uh, what the zoning limit says for the height of the roof. Okay. Section 5. Can I say something? Yeah, sure. Section 5.3.20. Chimneys, ventilators, skylights, water tanks, bulkheads, penthouses. All of which and, are functional elements. Wait a minute. And other accessory additions that are required or are customarily carried above the roofs of buildings, those are part of the maximum height exceptions. I mean, that's... Okay. We got enough information for this level. Right. And you're going to come yeah. back. Uh, Mike right. Yep, we're going to talk about that. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ma'am. Hello. Asha Kafka from Salt Street. Actually, you can see my house in one of the photos, so I'm very familiar with the area. And I'd like to, I don't know if you guys um, frequented uh, that area, it floods all the time. I walk um, down the bike path, and I've been living for 20 years. There's a lot of water when it rains. The water runoff, despite the fact that there is, you know, uh, green land along the river, <laughs> it, it gets significantly really, really high. It's a very uh, uh, sensitive ecosystem. Um, there's a bike path that, that's built there, and it, the reason that it's raised is because the ground is unstable. So I was really surprised that you are planning to build an underground garage because there's no doubt in my mind that uh, the garage will be flooded and by the same token it will contaminate the water. Um, just recently I was taking a walk and uh, I like the sunsets. This is the area um, right across from the, the garage and proposed the build site. You can see a, a beautiful heron, blue heron sitting there. There was a couple of them. And um, unfortunately, one of them is dead. Oh. So um, it's a very small and very delicate ecosystem. I'm, I mean, I'm, I can talk to you about parking situation. Uh, all of us had carts uh, smashed. It's very difficult. This road is very, very small, very narrow. A lot of people complain about par double parking, triple parking. It's a very congested area as it is, and it's full of one single family homes, two family homes. So it's not going to be impacting um, us as citizens, but it's also the, the fragile animal wildlife. And uh, I know for sure you're going to have to have flood insurance. Can I ask her a question? Yeah. Have, I'm curious of whether you've seen flooding from Alewife Brook onto yes. the property, or just the general flooding in the area, but not the brook overtopping. So there's a the road, so there's a bike path, and there's a road, um, and that's flooded. Yeah. I know also the Route 16 gets flooded, which is a little higher elevation. But, I'm, but I'm specifically asking whether Air Life Brook has overtopped and flooded this site. You, uh, you sound like you don't know. It's, no. flooded, it's, it's flooded Broadway, where I live. I live okay, like on a, yeah. Okay. I don't know that particular site, but I don't flood Broadway. Yeah. Would you like us to tell you uh, about the flooding? On, let me know. call on you next. Okay. I think you know. Hmm? Yes. 
because I've been nominated to talk about flooding. My name is Steve Revelock. I live at 111 Sunnyside Avenue, and uh, it's in a floodplain, and I've got, we have two FEMA claims on our property from, uh, from the 21st century, one in 2001 and one in 2010. Now, in 2000, the, you know, the topology of Sunnyside Avenue, um, you have the road heading north, and the row houses on the right, there's about a seven foot dip um, where it goes down to the greenway. The worst I've seen, I've experienced flooding in the 12 years that I've lived there was about, uh, was approximately 14 inches in the basement, 14 or 16 inches in the basement. So it would, you would be, if it were to have flooded that site, it would have been about a foot over my first, over our first floor. Um, it never got anywhere near that. Was that coming up from the That was floor? coming up from Alewife, yes. So did you, did, did you see this site to see whether this site was flooded or you just oh, yeah. extrapolating from your experience? Well, it's, it, extrapolating and when, you know, if, you're, if your neighborhood's flooded, you go around and take a look. <laughs> there's um, the about the highest, well, what, one good indicator is there's a, a USGS brought, uh, US Geological Survey gauge at, um, at the um, Broadway. At Broadway Bridge. So you can actually, they have the, you can actually go and see how high the water went. Uh, this would have been March 21st, 2010 or so. Okay. Thank you. I, I, I need a GIS person which way from now mm -hmm. to help me get from the gauge to this property. Mm -hmm. Can you show that on your on your site mm -hmm. plan, just where that floodplain would be, that because, line? Because their material said they're not within survey, the FEMA 100 year flood. Mm -hmm. So have our survey do it. Yeah. yeah. Have, have an engineer do it. Yeah. So so we know what yeah. what it is, okay? Yeah. Um, you're saying, Steve, that your property's seven feet lower, right? Uh, yes. I mean, if you, if the board would like, I do have a sort I can provide you with a certified plot, plot plan with elevation markers. Um, You're going to get a floodplain survey. Well, Actually, I could give you. Yes, I could also provide you with a floodplain survey. Well, they're going to no, get, they're gonna get, <laughs> get it. But yeah, they. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. So, if they're all flood questions, can we kind of reduce it to a few? Go ahead. Uh, my name is Robert Morgan, uh, 37 Sunnyside Avenue. My house is between the Alewife Brook and this um, this proposed development. Um, my home has never flooded in all of the history that uh, of at least the 50 years that one of my ne uh, near neighbors has lived there, um, including in March of 2010, um, and. My house is significantly closer to the brook than this property would be. We need to get the facts and, from you, yeah. from the engineer, the civil engineer, and understand the history of it and the actual conditions relative right. to the people in that. Sure. But thank you. And and my home is not in a flood plain for insurance purposes. Just really? barely if we built a deck yeah. with people. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thanks. So I, I wanted to make a few um, comments or questions about uh, the site plan and the landscape character associated with the development. Um, I personally think it's exciting the idea of, the, of having a multi-unit, uh, multi-family um, construction here. But I, I, it seems to me that the area that would be um, one of the mo more important landscape zones is an, uh, along Sunnyside frontage, um, and that seems to be very minimal, around 30 feet. And so when we get a site plan with tree caliper gauges, it would be interesting to see if what can actually be there and if it makes more sense to have actually more landscape zone along Sunnyside. Mm -hmm. And that rear patio, it's a north, you know, pretty much a north facing patio with no programming and it's between a wall and a parking lot. So I'm wondering if it doesn't make more sense to actually try and improve the character of the street along Sunnyside, um, and particularly provide enough space that there could be trees, because that would be transformative for that mm -hmm. street. I think yeah. changing the character of the street from a garage-oriented automotive block 
which is pretty bleak, to one that is really about people living there and spending time and coming to the commercial. I think it'll also attract people to the commercial space, potentially wanting to sit in front of it in the sun there um, on the south side. So that, that would be my comment. I also think it's important when we do look at a site plan to understand the spot elevations because the site is really not flat. There's quite a bit of slope along the um, what the it looked like it sloped up. Yeah. 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 So, um, and understanding site drainage, especially because of the sensitive area that we're in, right next to the um, Alewife Creek. And not only that, but Sunnyside is, has terrible drainage. There's standing water at the intersection of Michael and Sunnyside every time it rains. There's standing water at Broadway and Sunnyside. So, I think understanding the drainage, not only of the site, but how it feeds into the street. Um, system catch basins is, is really important to understand the impacts, um, the environmental impacts of the project. Could we just get your name and address, sir? Leah Broder, I'm at 44 Michael Street. Good point about the street trees. I think it's a great yeah. point. Okay, um, next. Who is back. that? In the back. Hi. I'm uh, Kim Alexander, and it's 77 Sunnyside, and I sort of like what's being proposed. However, mm -hmm. <laughs> big point, traffic on Sunnyside. We've got a problem. During rush hour, um, and, you know, I know that there's an assumption that everybody's going to be biking and stuff like that, but you're also providing 33 spots for vehicles. Um, during rush hour, both in the morning and at night, if you're coming down Sunnyside towards Broadway, you cannot make a left-hand turn onto Broadway. There is no way, no how. Uh, a lot of people use Silk Street, use Gardner Street to make that left-hand turn. Um, it's a big problem. Um, the problem also uh, is um, that there's a lot of traffic coming from Somerville onto Broadway at rush hour. There's a lot of Route 16 traffic making that turn <coughs> on Broadway. So I think this really needs to be seriously thought about. Um, I'm not opposed to an apartment building being there. I think, you know, it, if done correctly, it could really add to the area. Um, I do agree with green space, more green space in the front. Um, there are a few parking spots at that brick building that's right on the corner with Sunnyside. Mm -hmm. I would suggest that maybe no parking be allowed in those spots so that we can get on the street on, on Sunnyside so that it truly is two lanes. It's a narrow two lane road. Um, the other thing is that the um, it is a great location to live because of public access to public transportation. Mm -hmm. However, you cannot cross over to the bus stop on the other side of Broadway to get the buses into the Boston area to the to the different to the red line, green line, um, orange line, because you just can't cross there. So I would suggest very strongly if you want people to use public transportation to use that bus stop that a crosswalk be put in there. Okay. Could you go walk down to the left of Parkway and wait for the light and cross the bus? And then go back to the bus stop? Okay. You might as well walk to Clarendon Hill stop okay. at that just point. Just yeah. You know what might be a good idea side of the for us is to get, Jimmy, is to get TAC if they can do it before our next hearing? We usually, now we go through our transportation planners. Is TAC up? The, operating it, it. No, they are still operating, no, but we, we go to the transportation planner and then we can, I'll have them we discuss it. tie these issues together, Absolutely. including we, the streetscape on Sunnyside Avenue, because it's going to go, hopefully, you know, if it works out, you set an example and it's allowed to continue, but that example yeah. should understand the traffic and yeah. also the basic street character. Yes. In the if I could just follow up, my name's Monique Chaplin. I live at 35 Michael Street. Um, on the the uh, congestion and traffic on Sunnyside, because Sunnyside also has uh, the uh, there's a there's a body shop. There's uh, the um, oil heat. Yeah, the uh, 
all my oil there, you get some larger trucks coming down. And if you're trying to turn onto Sunnyside from uh, Broadway, often you can't because there's either cars parked or a truck coming. They don't allow to go down Silk Street, but they do. Yeah, well, because they work there. That's, <laughs> that's where their work is. Um, so I do worry about um, uh, just the congestion of having more cars trying to go up and down that street um, in a very small space where it's already hard to make a turn. Um, and because we've mentioned also people having to go down uh, Silk, which is the other street on the other side, um, Michael Street is a very, sm it's a very small two-block two street um, with lots of children that play on that street all the time, and the thought of a lot of diverted traffic going down those, that street is really worrisome to us. Thank you. Thank you. New yes. hands yes. and then other hands that have been up before. So. I'm Wendy Gadehart, a resident on 60 Silk Street, and I have a wondering about the schools, how um, the additional students uh, <coughs> impact, how, how is that measured? Um, we have Thompson School that was built, had to be rebuilt uh, in order to absorb more students. How, how does uh, the town measure what the schools can absorb? Um, so I just wonder about the scalability of this of the project. I'm not a, I'm not opposed to an apartment uh, building going in there, but but how how will it impact our already burgeoning schools? That would be a question that I would have. Okay, Jenny, do you want to comment? I'm happy to comment on it. I mean, we we don't have a measurement for looking at how many new school children will come from a specific development or not when we're looking at housing like this. Um, also, a recent inventory of, I think this is Thompson, right? Yes. Um, apartments of four plus units, uh, the number of school children from those were actually only 11% of the Thompson district population. The rest of them came from the single family, two family, and three family dwellings in the area, so it was a very small percentage. This is one and two bedroom units being proposed, so I'm not sure if there's a correlation there or not, but. Um, you know, I don't know how else the board would like to look at this particular matter, but we have not evaluated that for other developments in the past. And that is the information from past developments and the school population at that particular district school. Chris? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chris Loretti, uh, 56 Adam Street. Uh, I have a few questions and comments. Uh, Mr. Nessie began his presentation uh, speaking about the developer and his reputation. I was wondering if uh, through him we could ask whether, um, are there any other members of the development team, and if there are, who are they? I, I can't hear you, Mr. Wright. I was just asking, uh, is, is uh, are there any other members of the development team, or is uh, the gentleman here the sole developer? He is the sole developer. Okay. Um, the, uh, I would note that this relief um, under Section 5.3.6, which is to increase the floor area ratio, wasn't something that was requested as part of the special permit application, at least not in, in the version that was on the website. Um, but notwithstanding that, I do appreciate your going to the uh, building inspector and, and asking to get more information from him. And I would really encourage you to get it in writing. Um, We're going to get a letter ahead of time. And I think, I think there are two issues that are in the you know, they'd like to see in writing. One is whether a lot of less than 20,000 square feet qualifies, because it seems pretty clear to me when the bylaw says it has, if it has a principal use of residential, which this clearly does, it has to be at least 20,000 square feet. Um, but even if he says it doesn't have to be 20,000 square feet, then you still have to show what you're doing to qualify for these bonuses, and I really haven't heard anything about that. Um, and, and that kind of leads to my next question that pertains to this uh, figure here, it's related anyway. I, I'm a little unclear on the gray area um, in this figure, particularly on the top of it. What is what is that showing? Is that the paved area or um, just just what is that? Chris, I believe he's just showing that is the rear patio. It's no, the, 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 where does the patio end and the parking or the building? The, the white line is a wall separating the at grade parking inside the building with the building over the top of it okay. from a 
strip of pavement, which is a, a patio. So we're going we're gonna to see how that works. We're going to see three dimensions. We're going to see a section. And we're also being, I thought it was a great comment that it's po if possible, shift the building back, create a sidewalk and street trees on Sunnyside, and maybe that little patio, which may not be that very We just have to be careful when we do that that we don't violate the Correct, zone. correct. Okay. So the short answer is yeah. it's a, the top gray is an at-grade patio, and the gray below the white line is an <coughs> inside parking lot. Okay. Could you ask uh, the gentleman to show how, they show something like 6,000 square feet of usable open space. And I'm, I'm wondering if they could just show on this figure where that is. Can you guys How do they get up to that? that or? Yeah. It's this area in here. It's this area in here. Okay. And that's why we've got the 25 feet and the 25 feet. So pushing the building back, um, we, would, we would lose the open space behind the, open space behind right. the building. Because it does very specifically say that you need a minimum of 25 by 25 to, to be considered the open space. You know, come up with 20, 24 foot 11, it doesn't qualify. I see, I see. Well, when you show us the site plan with the whole street and the mm -hmm. curves, we'll, I don't even know where the curb is. It's not even on there, but you're going to show the that. The curb is right here, yes. You're going to show that next, yeah. Yeah, right, when you do we'll, we'll do a small plan that shows, you know, right. all the surrounding area. Um, and then I, I would just do a calculation and show us a red line about what's considered absolutely. open space, and then that would answer that question. Absolutely. Um, just a couple other questions. The, um, has anyone done the analysis of the height buffer? Regulations and how this that they apply to this building. It's, it's not. It doesn't abut any residential. It does. Um, it doesn't have to abut them. It's just that the residential districts have to be within a certain distance of the. It's not. No. I don't think it actually has to abut. <laughs> um, and then the other question is: Is did I read that there will be a, a sidewalk in front of the building? And if so, how wide will that be? That's going to be illustrated in the next round. Okay. I don't know how wide it is because it's not shown on the plan, but that was one of my comments. Okay. And I would, I would echo the comments that, um, you know, in addition to the sidewalk, we probably don't want to allow parking in front of the building simply because on a two-way street, I, I checked, it's only a 40-foot right-of-way for this street. It, it is tight there. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. There's two more. Steve, I, I you already said something, though. I, I, it's okay. There's a lot to say. I'll, one brief question. Uh, the planning department's memo, uh, question number two, talks about affordable, uh, the inclusionary zoning provision. Um, I believe it says 80%. I'm wondering if that's a typo, I, or I was under the impression that owner-occupied units required 70%. Mm. Oh, you know what? It's probably predating. It's probably... It's because the plans changed okay. from rental units to ownership. Yeah. Okay. Um, you're right. Yes. But, uh, <laughs> That's a, that is a type of them. Yeah. Okay. So Thank we'll you. Be. Thank you. And yes. can be brief yes. because you've already yeah. spoken. Um, um, That's okay. Just, just a question. This may not be you know, the place to talk about it, but what are the cost of these units going to be? The <laughs> other thing is the retail space. The only concern that I have about that is that it is on Sunnyside. I don't mind that it's on Sunnyside. I hope somebody opens a fabulous cafe there. We would love it. It's just that if you don't have, there's not going to be any parking for the retail space, apparently. And also, because it's not, there isn't a lot of foot traffic, is the retail space also going to be a condominium or sold as a condo? How would you guys picture that retail space? Um, probably not. It's probably just um, probably pretty much what the market would bear at the time. So I wouldn't I wouldn't really know right now because it's probably you know, 2020 sometime or 2021 by the time everything's done. Kind of a market driven issue. It's really a market driven issue. Yeah. Um, yeah. And one last one. I'll be brief. So just back to this kind of street character, I wanted to just make a comment about the use of materials and the dramatic difference between the Sunnyside elevation and the other elevations. And to point out that, and I think we'll hopefully see this when we see rendered views from the street, but there 
the other sides of the building are very apparent, particularly because it is so much taller than everything around it. I think it's important for the character and uh, you know the kind of level of detail that's being shown on sunny side should be carried to the other sides of the building. Where it's not immediately adjacent to other buildings, so there are views of that building. The, the west side of it, the west elevation, and the north elevation can be viewed from Broadway and Silk Street, um, at least in currently. Um, and then the other question is a geotechnical report. Is that not part of the re requirement to understand what where groundwater is? And that's a civil. So that's a civil site plan with flood indications and topography and utilities. That's a civil site plan that they are going to provide, right? In the next correct. Geotech is soils, meaning bearing capacity of the soil. Right. I guess I would just I would have assumed that. That would be somewhat, you would have done that homework already if you're building a garage, if you're building a basement, and, and that would give us some of the information about. I think they just need to give us civil, they need to give us all the mechanical and drainage and all those issues, but it's their problem. It's going to be our problem too. We want to know that it's been thought about, but the foundation system is. And the other thing should too be is described. To, you can say what it is. Yeah, if a developer is going to spend money, he wants to have some sort of a read that what he's proposing uh, might be something that could be doable. Uh, so my experience with the ARB is I've never had a hearing where it's been one time, okay? It's always been more than one time at a hearing, okay? Uh, now, he's prepared to spend the money that has to be spent to bring to the board what has to be brought to the board, okay? Uh, but again, uh, the, before he uh, spends a million dollars on this, a lot more than a million dollars, he just likes to have a read uh, as to what's going on. And I'm getting that now. By being here tonight, I'm getting it. Okay? I'm hearing from you folks, and I'm hearing from these folks. And we are as well. Okay? So this has been very profitable for us tonight, and I think we need to go to school. Right. What, what are you hearing? Tell me what you're hearing. Pardon me? What are you hearing from everybody? What's what I'm hearing takeaway? is that uh, there are some concerns uh, about flooding, certainly, and you've mentioned that, okay? Uh, there are some uh, concerns about traffic as well, okay? Uh, on the other hand, uh, you've heard from me, okay? And what I'm suggesting to you is uh, that you've got an area here that essentially is blighted and has been blighted for some substantial period of time. You've got a developer, and he is a sole developer, Mr. Already. okay? You've got a developer who's prepared to come in and spend money and essentially provide housing, but also improve the area, okay? But again, if he's going to do that, he needs to know that it's something, he's not throwing uh, something against a wall that's not going to stick, okay? And again, I'm hearing from everybody tonight. Okay? We're hearing from everybody that we're going to go to school on that, okay? But again, I'm hearing concerns, okay? I'm not going to leave this room without uh, uh, knowing that uh, we have concerns. Yeah, let me just say, I mean, I agree with the people in the room who said it has the potential to be a really good project right. and something that will help the neighborhood. Right. So I think if we start there, yep. then the two issues are, can you make the project work with all of the issues right. that came out, and can the project fit within the zoning requirements? Exactly. So those are the two big right. and, and I agree. We do appreciate yeah. the But do you understand our what position? What can happen on okay. that great neighborhood? And yeah. we're hearing for some people who yeah. come up the neighborhood and, and want to see it. Yeah. Want to see and and I'm sure they'd love, love so, to see the neighborhood be improved with respect right. to so this I think junkyard, all, basically. All, yeah. Yeah. Meeting, yeah. meeting in good faith in the middle. Yeah. Can I... Um, if everything is, is done here for public comment, I would like to entertain a motion to continue. So motion, I'd like to, uh, to say. What, to what I think it has to be uh, April 8th. A motion to uh, What date? Uh, it's the it's the April meeting before at that time. Before town meeting. What you're talking? It's not just me. It's a couple other you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. people as well. Right. Um, so I think. All right. But for tonight, yes, I think it's certainly. Right. Why don't we say April eight? But uh, we need to do some homework, okay? And if I need to come back to you 
and ask that it be continued. If I need to come back to you and ask that it be continued one more time, uh, please don't have a problem with that. Because we need some work. We need to do some. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question for the board related to this. Uh, can you hold it? Hold off. This mode. Yeah, that's the potential we might need to go to. It sounds okay. like they're a little tight on the That's tight for all of So if you can't do it, then we are going to have to wait until after town meeting. The board, unless the board meeting meets in? before a town meeting. I don't know. <laughs> you know how it goes. I mean, a town meeting begins on April 22nd, and it's Mondays and Wednesdays. And it just goes. And it, it, it may not be until mid-May that we're talking about. So we I want to pick a date now? I think we probably have to pick a date. I think we need a date, certain. Yeah. Um, so I'm not really going to calendar. What is it? May 20th? May 20th. It's May 20th. It's May 20th. It's a long time. Is that good for you guys? May 20th. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. May 6th is Christmas. Yeah. May 20th. So that's the next meeting? Not no, that's, the next meeting is next What's this project? <laughs> other meetings. So we're going to yeah. entertain a motion to continue this hearing to May 20th. May 20th. May 20th. So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. 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 I'm happy we're here. 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 i am happy we are here 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 i am happy we are
changes uh, to the requirements for multifamily uses, um, focusing on um, adjustments to uh, the minimum lot size, uh, the minimum frontage, minimum lot area per unit, um, setbacks, heights, uh, and minimum maximum floor area ratio for the um, four high density or higher density residential districts. So R4 through R7. Um, so the amendments in Article 6 are uh, relatively technical in nature um, and require adjustments to the tables as presented in the package. So how, Andy, how do you want us to have conversations about these or do you just want them to want Aaron to keep on going? Because I have lots of conversations. I, I think yeah. we should probably go one by one. I, I don't know. So at this time, yeah. we, through the zoning bylaw working group, we did receive comments. We do have some feedback from them. They're having a meeting also on Wednesday mm -hmm. for their comments. Next week, obviously, we start our public hearings. So I think that if you had anything that you wanted to provide tonight that we can work on between basically now and you know next week, we also have the hearing schedule, which notes when uh, specific um, articles are going to be heard. That could also dictate. You so know, when, is the, we when is the next the hearing, the public hearing? So when I pass out this Monday? schedule. Next Monday. Yeah, the fourth. So, gee, next Monday is it were is showtime. Next Monday is showtime, and we haven't had our showtime. Correct. Okay, so I'm, I'm, so, I'm, I'm you agreeing. Know, so how do we, what's the best way for us to get to this? That's my question. Yeah. I think um, either, you know, what, what you can provide tonight, and then the rest of it I would say suggest that you send as an email with any edits to it, which is how we've requested it to come from the Zoning Bylaw Working Group. Um, that could be one way to do it, and then what you think might be better resolved with the entire group, and save that for the, yeah. the group. So, so let me put out two or three big issues. One is, there are some parts of it that I think are fine. Some, I think, just can use some minor tweaks. Okay. There are a couple parts of it that I think need to be pretty much rewritten for me to be comfortable with them, and I couldn't vote for them the way they are. And then, and I don't know how we get from here to there. Yeah. And then for Article 6, 7, 8, 12, 11, and 13, maybe I missed some. But at least as those, I, I don't have any intention to vote in favor of them, mm -hmm. unless they're density bonuses in exchange for more affordable housing. I would tweak some of the language in some of them, but I would vote for them as density bonuses. So we would have two sets of, mm -hmm. we'd have the current ones and the proposed ones with a few minor adjustments. And if you want the extra density, you've got to give us more affordable housing. That's how I would vote for them. And otherwise, I mean, if everybody disagrees, I'll be outvoted and then I can go through the wording changes, which are probably better being sent than going through page by page. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I think the density bonus is something I think we should have a are conversation about. Adding more bonus or just the bonus that's allowed right now? No, no. If you want to, for example, let's take the first one. If you want all these changes on, let's say, page three and page four and page five and page six and page seven, what you'd have to do in exchange is provide more than the minimum amount of affordable housing that's required. Otherwise, you have to meet the requirements as they as currently exist. As they exist. currently exist. That's, that's an I interesting discussion that's, to have. That's how, the discussion I think we should have. So how do you do that for a three-family house? Well, we probably have to make some minor changes for things like three-family houses, but yes. I mean, I can see it applying to like an apartment, you know, maybe it was four units. Do we, do we say four or six units? Well, right now, so right now you have to have minimum six, and then you have one affordable unit. Okay. Right? So I would change it to say whatever number you're building, 
you have to have one more affordable unit than required. But if you're not required any, then you don't have to do them still. Well, I don't know. We have to have that discussion because well, I think maybe, right, so maybe, you know, I mean, I think we can move ahead in one way. I think we should reduce where the affordable housing number kicks in to five rather than six. And that anybody who's doing five or more needs to add one additional affordable unit on top of the in inclusionary amount if they want this package of density bonuses. If affordable housing um, kicks in, but if you had a three-family house... It doesn't kick in. But if we move it to five, then you have to do the extra affordable. <laughs> I, I gotta think this through now. I mean, well, you, yes. you, uh, you just threw this on here and like. Um, well, we don't have the opportunity to discuss these things outside these meetings. True. <laughs> um, what's that do? It's, it's kind of the way I, I'm thinking about it. It's you, you like the additional density. You like the additional FAR and heights, in principle, but you with a few exceptions. But you think there should be a give back. There know, should be a give back because when so we're it's, this it's is not upzoning, but it's the effect of upzoning. Yeah. So when we're giving people the opportunity to make more money with their property, yeah, which is what we're giving them the opportunity to do. We hope they take the opportunity, so the town gets some extra tax money from it. But it seems to me like the town needs to get more. And I think what we don't have is enough affordable housing in town, among other things. And this is an opportunity to do that. And density bonuses is a, are a pretty common way to get more affordable housing. You're not forcing people into it, but you're basically saying, if you want to take advantage of all this additional density mm -hmm. that you could have, here's what you have to give back to the town in exchange. The reason I'm thinking so hard, okay, <laughs> is the, the increased density you're offering, is that enough to offset the affordable that you, you're saying you get so that we're encouraging more housing and encouraging more affordable housing? Well, that's why I'm just suggesting one more unit. Because it could... Which could be a pretty big percentage. Mm -hmm. It could be a big percentage, I mean, because... I see your point. If it's 20 units or 60 units, one more affordable unit is not a problem. Well, and people who used to be able to come in and build a five unit building and not hit the threshold couldn't do that anymore because the threshold would right. then be they, five yeah. units. Yeah, they might not do, build it. But, 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 but there's something in what you're saying. I, I would wonder if. I'm not sure where that's standing. The last, now. last thing we can do now is kick cans down the road. but. It would be sure nice if the residential committee, the committee that's the housing, the housing plan, plan implementation. That's what committee. I said. <laughs> if they would weigh in on it, and that would have to be immediately in the next two to three days. Yeah, they are meeting. On, on such a big issue, Gene. That that's that's it is a big issue. I'd be happy to hear what they say. I'd actually be happy to go to their meeting if I'm available to talk to them mm -hmm. about it too. But, yeah, that's what I'd like to see. Okay. How can we make that happen? Because I think that's such a big issue that I'd like their, they've thought about this for, what, two years now. And they're going to have an opinion about thresholds mm -hmm. for affordable housing and what it would do to this whole. I mean, I, I hear it's interesting. And, and I, I kind of support it, but I'm just worried that what, by this, what you say is going to stifle what we're trying to do here. And I'm just worried about that. And I'm not disagreeing with you, Gene. Okay. Hey. Well, what is the formula for doing what you're doing? Maybe there's... I don't know what that no, is. No, I'm saying to you, yeah, so is there a way we can yeah. get them to look at it immediately and weigh in on it? Yeah. We have a meeting Wednesday. Yeah, there's yeah. a meeting on Wednesday night. We mm -hmm. do have an agenda, but we and can figure out a way and to and have you attend that, of course. But I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I think Wednesday, Wednesday night, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, 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 he has yeah. an issue. Yeah. Cool. 
I, I, I've, re I've really got to take our okay. comments. I, yeah. No, I, I hear your concern. I, I really appreciate your your suggestion, Gene. Um, it's I've I've had this uh, vague discomfort uh, as we've been thinking about the the, the zoning proposals with uh, you know creating an opportunity um, for higher density development but even if we do that there's, there's a limited amount of development that can ever happen in, in Arlington and I'm my kind of discomfort was if we create that opportunity and the develop and allow the development to start happening without having some kind of step forward on the affordability issue then we're we're, we're decreasing the pool of possible future development opportunities where we could have affordable units because that that pool is only going to be a certain size and it's never going to be very big and it's going to be shrinking as soon as we open the floodgates. Um, so I, I like the idea of doing something simultaneously and I hadn't crystallized an idea um, uh, beyond what what Steve Revelack had had put forth, um, uh, tweaking the inclusionary zoning provision, um, but I, I I like what you're thinking. But I, I am I, I do I do hear the concern about how does the how does the math work out, mm -hmm. right. and and are we creating an appropriate incentive, or are we unintentionally creating a disincentive? Yes, because. <laughs> I mean, we haven't actually seen what this build out would look like, right. which is one of the disadvantages. But it seems to, and, and we don't know sort of which lots will take advantage of this, et cetera. But I think with the extra story, with the reduced setbacks, and some of the other things, people are going to have the opportunity to build significantly larger buildings than they would. I mean, they're not going to be monster buildings, but, you know, something that might be two or three stories high with three or four apartments could be four or five stories high with eight or nine or ten apartments. And I'd like us to take advantage of that and get some more affordable units out of it. Can I state the other? Oh, I, I'm just, I'm state away! <laughs> <laughs> what I'm just saying is, let's not look at... Uh, Let's not look at purely affordable units. That's what I'm trying to say, okay? I, I want to look at a diversity of units. So we're increasing the stock of not only affordable units, but um, working class units, or people who, who doesn't quite fall in that, uh, I need assistance, but people who have worked two jobs and want to, and want to live here kind of attitude, all right? And I think by in, and by addressing that, it's it's kind of a market-driven supply and demand. If you increase the amount of units there are, then the, the demand goes down and the, and the cost goes down. So it, it it sort of affords like the middle class having a chance at something too. I'm not trying to try to say we're only addressing one. Uh, I don't know section of the community. I, I, I like to look at the whole way and, and make it a diverse... Uh, there's, there's inclusionary uh, and there's affordable. There's a Yes, and that's what I'm trying to right. say that if you, if you just say we're going to keep on doing this inclusionary and doing this affordable and then it puts a, it puts a stymie on development where there's no middle class or working well, class that, yeah. that, that gets left behind. And I don't want, I'm just saying think about it. I'm not I, saying I, I'm right or wrong. I'm just want to think about it because there's a lot of people that I mean, I don't just be a working class. Uh, right. Well, how do we how do we influence that though? Because market rate is market rate. Right. Yes. No. How you influence is by supply and demand. You could create another category which is not as stringent as an inclusionary exactly. unit. I, I don't know. I, I'm I'm just right. I just want to bring it up. To discuss amongst us here, okay? Right. Because I mean, we, we I think the inclusion right now is sixty percent of AMI, or eighty um, well, percent. It, yeah, it depends upon if it's rental or condo. Yeah, mm. right. Yeah. It's so, so we could, as on Andy's suggestion, we could create this other category that's let's say, a hundred percent or hundred twenty percent, 
mm-hmm. of AMI. I wouldn't want to do that in any way that would reduce the number of affordable units that are, that are built, but that would, that would start creating sort of the workforce housing level mm-hmm. that, you know, as Kin said, is pretty much disappearing from the town. I don't want the, I don't want yeah. one or the other. Well, we, right, we want to have our cake and eat it too. Yeah. We want to have more density, we want to have more affordable units, and we want to have more sort of workforce income units, and how do we get those all? We have some people, I think, from yeah. that group. There's two people from are the there, housing Right. Are there any other big issues? Just, to, we'll go to that now, but are you in the group? Are there any other big issues? Or? I mean, I, I have some major problems with the bicycle parking, yeah. and I would um, want to rewrite it pretty much completely to feel comfortable with it. Um, I, I want to have a separate discussion about the accessory units because I think they're a good idea, but I don't like the way they're proposed here. So there's just a lot of stuff like that. And I still have some problems with reducing parking numbers. I could agree to a small reduction if it was tied to density bonuses. But <coughs> okay. So there's a lot. So um, just a quick thing. Um, the residential study group is meeting on March 8th. March 8th. Um, to talk about the accessory dwelling yep. unit yeah, we'll proposal. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's just something coming up so you're aware. And then the Housing Plan Implementation Committee, obviously, I've already said this, meets on Wednesday night. So that might be an opportunity, but there is also there are two members here tonight. Before we yeah. open the public, are there any other issues you want to jump into, or do you want to get that input and come back? I would mind getting some more input. Okay, just so around we're the gonna, committee. I, that's why I thought we're going to get some. You've heard the discussion. We're going to like to hear from the Housing Plan Implementation Committee. I thought you were interested <laughs> in saying something. I'm not putting no, you on the spot. Are you on it? I'm yeah. just. Uh, no, where I am curious she's about actually is... Uh, you have to say your name and... Oh, I'm just, sorry. My name is Cyril Silverman, and I live at uh, 40 Oakland Ave. Um, and I'm just joined the committee, so I'm now, I'm pretty fresh. Um, but can you go, when, when you say, talk about affordable, you know, what percent, I, percentage of the income are we looking at? I know it's all written down, but... So, so here's an affordable, we're having an apartment, up in an affordable apartment, so you make this much, we decide. I used to run a nonprofit agency and we had to do it with kids and their families, but that was a long time ago. And c- what's the formula you're using, please? Can you state that, Jenny, because sure. you're probably the best for yep. it's Yeah, or Aaron. It, you want to talk about it? Sure. Um, as, uh, as it's defined in the zoning bylaw, um, it depends on the type of unit. Mm-hmm. So if it's um, a ownership unit, um, the uh, eligible household um, cannot be, their total income cannot exceed 80% of the area median income. But the housing costs, so um, mortgage, interest, taxes, association fees, etc., cetera, um, cannot exceed uh, 30% of a household that's making 70% of the median income. Right. So there's there's a lot of percentages there. Right, right. The 80% area median income, so you have a baseline, is $81,100 for a family of four currently. Mm-hmm. So looking at apartments, um, the eligible household to move into that apartment, they cannot have an income that exceeds 70% of the area median income. Eighty percent of the eighty. Seventy uh, percent of the area okay. of the income. So which is eighty? Eighty-four, you said. Oh yeah, eighty um, percent is eighty-one one hundred. Oh, I see. Okay. Currently, so seventy percent would be a little okay. bit lower than that. Um, so their housing costs, so um, rent, um, and it also would include utilities, cannot exceed thirty percent of. Uh, the income of a household at 60% Mm -hmm. mean income. So it's staggered like that to give a little bit of breathing room um, between the the income of a household and um, the rent or their total housing costs that they're paying. Um, That offset is um, not super common in 
inclusionary yep. articles, but it's it gives a little bit of breathing room um, when rents are increasing year over year. So, so you, I thought you were talking about purchase units, but now well, you're both. I it's moved on to apartments. Okay. If, you, if you get the zoning, if you just get the zoning bylaw and look in the definition section for definitions associated with affordable housing, right. it's all there and like just that much. I, and I appreciate that. I just started reading the zoning bylaws. And yeah. um, so do, 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 do you agree that that, may, that that would, so that would be really affordable housing? I mean, is that what you really agree about? What the, what the, yeah. What that comes out to be in terms of what people yeah. are paying and what the income is—is is that? I just yeah. I'm asking the question: Is that yeah. affordable housing? I, I think the question is, for us, that's you know inclusionary housing is part of our zoning bylaw. Mm -hmm. So we're getting into a debate now about what is inclusionary housing and right. how approved. And I think that goes to the committee that you're on. Okay. <laughs> that but then reports back to the ARB right. and says, here's our recommendation. But we, if we start vetting that right now. Yeah, no, no, I'm glad yeah. you said that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. I, just want to, I have a couple comments, but I wanted to follow up on the discussion of numbers. Um, my name is Elise Selinger. I live at 37 Thorndike Street, and I'm actually an affordable senior housing developer. I work for a nonprofit called Two Life Communities that's out in Brighton, Massachusetts. So I do this day in and day out like this morning. Um, so, but just to let the committee know, if you're a family of four and you pay 30% of your income and you make at 80% of AMI, which we just established is $80,000, um, the most you could afford for rent for your family is between $1,900 and $2,000. And you cannot find a one bedroom in Arlington for $1,900 or $2,000, let alone for a family of four. Mm -hmm. So, just so everyone's clear, like, even this group that we're saying is perhaps not truly in need of affordable housing still is in need of affordable housing in Arlington. Arlington. And then our committee should consider lower levels or deeper levels, excuse yeah, me, right. of affordability beyond that. Um, the economics of that though are really tricky because for a developer to pencil it all out, you do need public and state resources to make that work and those are really competitive so i think mm -hmm. the town also needs to think about when was the last you know 40b permit when was the last tax credit project that went in and how um friendly is the town to all of those types of programs that come with vouchers that achieve deeper levels of affordability so i think coming back to the committee with a more robust discussion about deeper levels important. of affordability and even thinking about hiring a consultant to help us analyze those different opportunities could be interesting. I know that um, the city of Newton is going through that now, and I can't say if it's a good process or a bad process, but what I do know is that it's bringing up a lot of policy questions that are really worthwhile, um, and it would be worthwhile for the town to go through that too. Okay. Yes. Hi, um, I'm Ben Rudick, I'm at 40 Web Cowett. Um, I feel like I can bring a little bit of clarity to the math discussion you were referring earlier. Um, by profession, I'm a commercial real estate analyst. Um, I work on large commercial developments, largely in Asia, but also in the uh, New England area. I have never and never expect to work on anything in Arlington. Um, <laughs> I have looked at some things in Boston City just by the nature of the scale of the projects I work on. Um, for a uh, typical multifamily development or condo development, um, the rule of thumb would be that every affordable unit you build, um, you are almost always building at a significant loss um, below the cost of, of your steel and your, you know, so on and so forth, and your land. Um, and it will take anywhere between one and three affordable <coughs> units to offset the loss of one the to three market, market. Yeah. one to three market one rate market. units to offset. to offset the cost of an affordable unit. It can be higher depending on how thin your margins are. So um, if you think about in your example of having <coughs> a five unit building that is now one unit more affordable to get the bonus, um, that building might need up to three more market rate units with the density bonus for um, the de developer to be back to um, square one, uh, let alone have a um, sort of profit motive. Um, the other thing that I'd like to bring up is that I think there's a common misconception that as you allow greater density that you are automatically increasing the profits of the developer. Um, those profits tend to be realized at the land level. So when a parcel of land goes up for sale, it's a competitive open bid process that's very well marketed by all the brokers around here. And if I am, as a developer, able to build more on a lot, that usually just means that the landowner will charge more or expect more for their land. 
and me and the other developers will be um, looking at the minimum profit margin that we can have make sense, and then the rest of that value is going to flow to the land. Um, so um, I, I am very concerned personally about the affordability of housing, not an affordable housing program, but sort of like how do young families like the one I have ever live here in Arlington? Like why are housing so expensive? And um, it is almost always the case that an increase in capital A affordable, like affordable housing programs, um, comes at a direct cost of um, the affordability of the market rate units. And so um, if I had my druthers, we would um, have uh, uh, actually quite little on the capital A affordable and produce as much market rate housing as we could so as to increase the housing stock and, and make um, families like me more able to live here. So thank you. Interesting yeah. perspective. Double-edged sword. My, my sort of perspective is that the housing market is metropolitan-wide. Yes. Right. And the number that we build in Arlington probably will have little or no impact on area housing prices. Sure. But if we require some affordable units, there will be more affordable units th than exist now. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, there will be. I mean, to some degree, um, this is a sort of tragedy the commons type problem. You know, we're about 300,000 units short for Greater Boston. Right. And so um, the question is sort of what can Arlington do? And most yeah. towns are thinking similarly. And so uh, a, a fraction of the towns that have commuter rail stops have built more than 10 more housing units in the last year. And that's true for most years. Okay. Uh, we don't really build. But Thank you. Oh, I want to. My turn? Yeah. Oh, hi. I'm Joanne Preston. I live at 42 Mystic Lake Drive in the Webb Cowett neighborhood. I just um, looked at the exclusionary zoning bylaw. Inclusionary. Inclusionary, excuse me. And we have no the exclusionary zoning. Our normal housing market is exclusionary. It's been. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I like to speak. Um, if you, and even what went after, as you know, the, the first time it was evaded by this project over on Mill Street in Mass Ave, that that was developed, and he just divided it all into townhouse, small townhouse lots, no affordable housing in that. Now we've lost that piece of land. That's the corner of Mill and, and uh, yeah, Mass Ave. There's, there's, a, there's a big back story, which we won't yeah, get no, into. No, we don't want to get into that. We don't want to get into that. Let's just wild. say, there's no, <laughs> there's no affordable housing wild. there. And so there was a way to try to stop that by saying you can't divide the right. lot. However, the seller could divide it before, that was before it sold. Our and laws. thirdly, right. it only works for two years. Right? That, I mean no. if you own it that's what it says. No, no. inclusionary is permanent. No. permanent. no, no. If you can divide the lot Yeah, but that's a whole other issue. You're you're going back in No, time. I'm just saying that it's not an, I mean I'm happy to hear about more affordable housing. But to realize that some loop loopholes have to be yeah. uh, changed, if because we could put this all through and end up with no affordable housing. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Wayne Evans, Orchard Place. I'm I'm thrilled to hear you all put affordability at the at the top of the list, and I'm really happy to hear you, Ken, talk about beyond affordability. Like, what about low cost housing and and true diversity in our housing stock? So I have uh, one comment, though. Some of the research that I have been doing indicates that you know, as common sense would tell you, new construction is going to be more expensive. And I'm really concerned about what happens to the people who are going to be pushed out when properties are redevelopment developed. Let's say you've got a four-unit building on Mass Ave, and the owner puts that up for sale, a builder buys it, he demolishes it. Those tenants have to leave. Four units go up at market rate. Now we've just lost relative affordability. This is something we talk about in the residential study group a lot. Um, you've lost relatively affordable units because those people have been booted out and they cannot afford to rent or buy the new market rate housing that has put, been put in place. And I think that's a, a really significant concern that has to be addressed because I think we're, we're going to see a, a forced demographic shift. And the other thing I'm concerned about is a little bit peripheral to what Joanne mentioned but the possibility that with our affordability requirement where it is today at six units, there are so many ways for a builder to, to legally build right up to that and never uh, build anything affordable. 
And I've thought for years about why don't we link the affordability requirement to the developer rather than to the development. And maybe we could think about that if somebody builds X number of built of units within a year or whatever period we wanted to set, regardless of whether they are physically connected to each other, at a certain point that developer would be required to provide, you know, X number of affordable units to the town. Can I just say something about that? Mm -hmm. I, I thought about that too, okay? And I think a loophole is the developer would just change his LLC for every single project it's he works on. Exactly. Yeah, it's okay, it's and really, I, I don't know really how you how really would you follow you know, you can't yeah. like photo ID the guy and say, Okay, yeah, yeah, your LLC was this, now your LLC is this. Yeah, I, and I, that's I, exactly I, what is um, some of what is being done. And so yes, I realize that. And most developers, I believe form an LLC every, yeah, at every single project because yeah, they don't want to tie their uh, risk right. from other projects. Right. So right. I, I hear you what you're saying, I just don't know how we... How to go about it. Or, yeah. or do we have to go about that? I mean, yeah. is there another way of get, getting what you want or what we want as opposed to, as opposed to doing that? That's what I'm... That's yeah. Yeah. And, and I think... I, I think what I'm hoping to do is, within the framework of the existing warrant articles, figure out how we can generate more affordable housing. A couple of the things that other people talked about are really good, but I don't think they fit in to the framework of the warrant articles we put forward, so I think that's like next town meeting. Mm -hmm. If we can get to it soon enough, we can craft, you know, Warrant articles to deal with some of those other so, issues, so we're but we're now dealing with the Steve's, um, which would just up the affordability numbers above a certain number of units. But the others we're dealing with, with a few exceptions, are really just the density, and that's why I thought we need to turn them into density bonuses. Steve, so I'd um, you probably like Woodland and Sunnyside Avenue. I'd I'd actually like to propose something a little more radical. Um, one of the reasons housing is expensive here is that, you know, Andrew Bennell, he's not here tonight, but he said it a couple of meetings ago, you know, in the 1970s, we had a, we had a knee jerk reaction to apartments mm -hmm. and we, the, you know, the planning department at the, t at the time wrote the zoning laws in order to reduce population and especially to prevent the construction of new multifamily housing and in particular new apartments. So one of the things they weren't facing at that time are the land costs we face now. Mm -hmm. And land is, land costs is really, it's a really dominant driver of what it costs to build. Just as, as a fun little exercise you could do, you know, you know, do the next, do the next time when you've got 10 minutes is you take your typical lot or, you know, resident, vacant little lot, $350,000. Your construction costs, 250 bucks a square foot. Come up with a design where you can build Units at say two hundred fifty to two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. Hint: You can't do it with just one unit on a lot. <laughs> but one of the what I think we would I, I would kind of like to see us entertain the idea of doing is to say, okay, we want more affordable housing. Let's come up with some price points. Let's mm -hmm. do a construction, but let's do some budgets. Mm -hmm. Come up with a couple of designs, and then change the zoning to accommodate the designs. Right. Not for this year, but it's something I'd like us to think about. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Folks, uh, we have to wrap up our discussion at some point here. So, I mean, I'm interested in hearing what the housing group has to say about this in their meeting. It would be great if you could address it. Um, Gene, I don't know how to pr proceed on that big issue without having another discussion about this and getting some recommendation. But I think we should go ahead and, and people should think about it. Yeah, think about it. Get your comments in writing and all of us at this point. I don't think it's productive for us to go through every little item. I think sending them by email yeah. to us makes the most sense. We can talk about them. We can also, if depending upon when you send them, we could share them with the Zoning Bylaw Working Group on Wednesday as well because they're evaluating things. So um, that would be my... Well, what I haven't done is sat down and rewrote it because if everybody thought I was wrong, I didn't want to spend the time to rewrite <laughs> things. But realistically, I'll send them on, but... It, how do we get from there to like, yeah, do we want to make these changes or not make these changes? 
and a lot to happen at that meeting, yeah. mm -hmm. which we knew was not ideal. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Well, you also don't have the full, right, we also, full group right, here, right, so right. I think that also changes the conversation a little bit, too. Right. Um, you don't Dave, have to do it. Dave or Ken, do you have any uh, time. thoughts? Any other thoughts? I'm just trying to think of something, because I, I, I hear your arguments, and I'm not necessarily, if you were to go and change it to what you say, I don't think I'm comfortable voting for that right now. Just to be, you know, mm -hmm. on the, of what you're saying, okay? And I, I, I think we're kind of at a crossroad here because we mm -hmm. don't have enough time to talk about this. Right. And, um, and I, you know, I, did, I came here today wanting um, to look at some more descriptions of how this affects it, and how we're going to illustrate this stuff at the, the next four, at the next four four coming meetings. You know, still have, don't have anything. On not, I know, but 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 now. Gene's brought up this other stuff. This is actually really yeah. brought everything yeah. back now, right. and 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 I'm not sure we have enough time to talk about that. Um, and so I, I'm thinking maybe we should look at what can we talk about, what 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 we do agree upon, and. And then see what we don't agree on. See if, if there's enough time to. Well, I mean, there there are some things that I think we should agree upon, although they need some work. I mean, we need to change the sign regulations, mm -hmm. and they have nothing to do with density bonuses and things like that. There are a lot of ch sort of um, corrections in some of these that need to be made to the regulations. So and those can I just can well, if you look at the schedule, yeah. The sign yeah. this, this document. Yeah. Yeah. The sign thing is, is the fourth, which is not bad. That's next week. Uh, the floodplain, I think we. The floodplain we're going to agree on, right? Yeah. It just, okay. I think it's uh, just The inland wet, wetland Same district. Thing. We're oh, okay. So those two are all pretty simple. Right. Uh, review of the uh, religious education, you know, that's the Dover Amendment, right? And you we, said we're going to, we have to do that too. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you, you're okay with that, right? Right, right, right? So, and then administrative corrections. I assume that's just right. administrative corrections. So right. I just type those in. Right, so. And, so then, and then it's what to do about the accessory units, which are not the density stuff. Right. But so when does the density come? Which meeting? Those are 11th and the 18th, basically. That's and we divide not it next Monday, up. but the following. No, the following Monday, right. So there's, and I'm not here on the 11th. Oh, you're not. not. That's not, that's not good. Yeah, that's fine. But I'm here on the 18th. Okay. Yeah. So you're gonna miss one of those meetings. Right. right. I mean, I. And then accessories, uh, right. and the, everything else is on the 25th. So, and that's the te that's the public meeting. So we don't have a chance meetings. really to right. discuss right. any kind of new strategy. Right. But I did come. I agree with Ken. I guess it was saying. I, I thought that we would get some graphic material to understand what it physically means to the town. Mm -hmm. And another architect, I <laughs> give credit to him, mentioned it a month ago. Mm -hmm. and, and my way of saying it is kind of, I always do this and no one knows what I mean, but it means that there's higher density in nodes. Mm -hmm. It drops off. Mm -hmm. It comes back up again. It's not a town with a continuous corridor, let's say, like between Porter Square and aiming toward Mass, uh, aiming toward Arlington, where it's just on the walls, both sides. It's much more porous the way we think about it. It's a street, trees, open spaces, openings, and so forth. But I can't get a handle on that. Mm -hmm. I don't have anything that I can see. I, I want a, a model of Mass Ave or a drawing of Mass Ave or a plan, just a site plan. So what we, it what says we what could be developed in a series of overlays right. to saying this is what could happen by right, sure. this is what might likely happen, and that kind of but thing. But the board, you all know that we are waiting for the build-out analysis and the visualizations and the shadow studies. We anticipate that they'll come to us this week, and as soon as we get them, we'll send them your way. But it, that, just, that's still the same, us into a, the same timeline that it's been on since yeah. we talked about it to begin you, with. I think so. you're going to give us something about the materials, but... I did. I sent that okay. with the with the as a follow up email. So to that the last your meeting. department can't produce just a site plan that shows what we are actually talking about doing that, but it will likely not happen immediately. Okay. You know, within the timeline that you're talking okay. about by next week, but perhaps by the 11th. Okay. 
Okay. So yes, we are talking about something. I don't know if it'll be exactly like what you've outlined. Some Ill illustration of what this zoning what, means what we to, can do with means to the core. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, the other stuff that, that we've talked about, which is being produced by yeah. MAPC, um, yeah. that will be sometime later this week. Okay. So at this point, I'm hearing we're going to ask the housing group to comment on their Wednesday meeting. If, if um, Jean, if you get anything out to to Jenny, they she could transmit it to the housing group. If you don't, we don't expect you to go on. Did did I hear Jean say he wasn't going to be here for one of the meetings? Yeah. No, we're just talking about this week now. No, I I I probably won't be able to do anything between now okay. and Wednesday night, but I can go to the meeting Wednesday. That would be mm -hmm. fantastic. That would be great and then give us feedback. When are we gonna get, we're, we need the documents as soon as we can so we can review them before the next meeting. But the next meeting is not gonna concentrate on those those items, so we have the one next, more. The next, so whenever we get the documents from MAPC, we'll forward them to you. Yeah. That's not gonna be in relationship to the hearing that we're talking about on the 11th anyway. Right. But so it, that, that those are Monday, two separate things. Monday. Monday night, you have a public, a slate of public hearings, we'll right. post the agenda probably. But those aren't covering Wednesday. the density issues. No, that's right. not until the 11th. So it gives us a little, right reading to get some reaction back mm -hmm. and, and Andrew I'm sure want to weigh in on all this yeah and we try okay. to divide I mean we, this is the proposed hearing schedule we tried to actually divide it up I mean there's yep there, yeah I mean yeah, we, you had to do it this is as good a way as any to yeah. do it. Yeah, yeah. no we, 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 we understand we're just reminding yeah. ourselves of where we stand so Andy there's basically there's 14 articles right now mm -hmm. and four of them right now we have issues with Right. Well, well, I have five that I want to have attached oh, to density bicycle, bonuses. Bicycle parking, I, I need to... I have bicycle. And then the okay. others where I don't careful. have issues I about density I bonuses, I have wording changes. I don't like the bicycle one very much. Um, I think there are one of two others. Uh, uh, accessory dwelling units. Accessory I have dwelling some units. About. Yeah. I'm not opposed to them, but I want to do some amending to the draft. If there was a way we could get this these drafts, Jenny, yeah, on a midweek basis, so that we could get back to you in this short period of time, you just I mean, send I can, me any. I can, I can send you. Amendments. I can send you the sign one because sure, I basically annotated the draft. But this is just my kick and scratches on the rest. Of it. Well, I will accept that, as you know. <laughs> so. Okay. Okay. I think if you can <laughs> somehow yeah. broadcast to the to, the, to uh, Andrew and then the board. Oh yeah. Our That's concern true. about making sure we're going to be editing, getting our comments in on time, and then having a way to review them again. Mm -hmm. That's really the big, bigger message. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, can I ask just a quick question? Sure. Can you tell us which articles are on the agenda for this coming Monday? This actually was posted, I believe. Oh, there, what? Right? Yeah, we'll give yeah. you a copy of this. Now. It's, um, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll get you it's, I believe it's on the ARB's page. I, oh, it is? I need okay. to it add it to the ARB's page. But yes. Yeah, it wasn't okay. there, was it? No, no it's not there. It's just, the, just the hearing list. Yeah, yeah but um, it is posted um, outside <laughs> our office um, on the bulletin board that we installed recently. But tomorrow That's morning, I will add this tentative schedule. Okay. And the location is here? No, no. they're no. all at the senior center okay. every, all, all of the evenings. Uh, when you get the build outs and everything, are they public? Will they be put on the mm -hmm. web page? Will they try yeah. to share them? Yeah. Right. They will be. Yeah. So when you get them. When Jenny gets them, she will yeah. distribute them and then they become public. Yes, right away. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Great. <laughs> but it will, it will happen, yes. Um, so I want to go. You're a funny man. Sorry for the car is too much damage. No, no, I have the car. No, 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 I don't need to have a fast you know. Yeah, so, all my neighbors here. We're going to go outside. We've got more meeting stuff going on. We're not done yet. Yeah, if you could bring your discussions outside. Thank you. Because we have to continue on. Yeah, we can do that. I have one. I got it. Okay. So, um, We've, we've gotten to item three. Um, 
the next items are meeting minutes. We really uh, don't have those meeting we're not, minutes. We're not going to do okay. meeting minutes today. So I'm, I'm ready to adjourn, but I want to make sure there are no other comments. That we need to postpone the uh, officially the officers, the organizational meeting. So we, do we need to vote on that? No, no, just, no. just we can't we'll do it move without it to the next meeting. Move yeah. it to the next. Well, You'll be here Monday, okay, though, right, Jeannie? Okay, so we'll all be together on Monday. That will be helpful. Okay. So that would be good to be in touch. Okay, I think that's it for tonight, isn't it? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.